Okay, let's get started. Because it's a beautiful summer day outside, so everybody is outside. We have a small audience. <laughs> That's good, you can ask questions. And maybe these will appear on the exam, right? <laughs> Let me reduce the microphone level. So before I start, we should talk about the exam. That's coming up next week. Is that right? November 30th, we said. Is that a good date for everyone? Yeah? <laughs> or do you prefer one week later? Doesn't matter. I see. <laughs> when is our lab due? Lab three? Do you know? 27th. Next Monday. Okay. And then we'll have the exam on Friday. On Thursday, we said. Okay. Uh, there won't be any lab due the week after that. So do you prefer the exam one week later? Let me take a vote here, perhaps. Yes. Yeah, that's, going, that's not going to be hard. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> so what do people prefer? Assuming the lab deadlines are the same and there won't be any lab the week after, not next week. Do you prefer to keep the same date for the exam, November 29th? Right, that's what we said. 30th, we said, okay. It's November 30th. Do you want to have it one week later? December 7th, correct? 7th or 8th, I think, one of those. Or 6th or 7th. Okay, who prefers uh, November 30th, the original date? Okay, who prefers 6th or 7th? Okay, <laughs> we have really <laughs> not a lot of participation here. Who, ca who doesn't care? Okay, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> now we can go on and on, right? Who strongly prefers <laughs> November 30th? No one strongly prefers November 30th? Yeah, maybe. Who strongly prefers December 6th or 7th? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, you have one champion for December 6th or 7th. So maybe I'll ask this question later again. <laughs> right, let's not make a decision, but I think that you've informed me a little bit. Uh, in the end, uh, I will not change the topics that are going to be covered. So you're going to be responsible for the same amount of material, regardless of whether or not we move the uh, exam date. So you won't, <laughs> you won't get the snowball effect if we move the date. Don't worry about that. We'll, we'll keep it fair. And do we know the date for the final exam? That's sometime in January, right? Or is it 29th of January. Okay, well, we should keep that in mind also. So that will cover the entire course. But uh, this one will decide until when we will cover. And I'll tell you later, <laughs> soon, when we decide the date of the exam. But probably this week will not be covered in the exam. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't pay attention to these lectures, though. <laughs> okay. So I think, that actually, let's make a decision right now. Let's say that exam will cover everything before this week. Nothing this week will be, uh, nothing that's covered this week and next week will be included in the exam. Is that fair? Okay, good. Okay, then let's start. Uh, I'll let you know of the final exam date now that I have, I have some information. If you, if you want to let me know, please email me also if you have any concerns. You can always email me, you know that. But now let's get to the lecture topic, which is another fascinating topic that's fascinated many people. Latency tolerance and prefetching. Uh, I'll motivate it in a different way. Uh, I figured out that I never motivated that way before, so <laughs> I've learned something uh, when I was preparing these lecture slides as well. But this is a topic that's really close to my heart, and you will see why soon, uh, because I worked on my PhD thesis uh, uh, for latency tolerance, and I'll talk about a mechanism that actually improves the latency tolerance of existing processors very significantly. Okay, but a uh, summary of last week's lectures. Can you guys hear me well? Okay. We talked about a lot of things, shared cache management, making caching more effective, heterogeneous multi-core, and bottleneck acceleration. We're going to wrap up heterogeneous systems quickly 
because I want to cover one thing, the frequency boosting that we got to at the last moment almost. And then I'll motivate memory latency tolerance based on that. And then we'll talk about prefetching if we get to it. So I, I expect both uh, tomorrow, today's and tomorrow's lectures will cover uh, these two. OK, remember this was uh, the last slide we covered last time. How do you achieve heterogeneity or asymmetry? We said that you can actually do it statically. You could fix the type and power of cores at design time. And there are multiple approaches to designing faster cores. You could actually hardwire some of them to have high frequency and voltage, because high frequency usually requires high voltage to drive the circuits. Uh, or you could build a more complex, powerful core with entirely different microarchitecture, a large out-of-order core, for example, as we've seen in the previous lecture. The second type of asymmetry is making it more dynamic. Type and power of cores can change dynamically. Uh, and we said that up there. Two approaches to dynamically create faster cores where one is boosting frequency dynamically with, uh, give, given a limited power budget. You always have a limited power budget. We didn't talk about that much, but I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. You can boost the frequency of one core significantly re while reducing the frequency of many, many other cores. As a result, you could execute the critical section on this large core, for example, or the bottleneck on this large or high frequency core. Or you could combine small cores to enable a more po complex, powerful core. And there's research in both directions, which I'm not going to get into for the second one. But I'm going to talk about this one a little bit. Uh, well, I guess there's one more slide that I want to cover. One is uh, basically static. Uh, if you actually have a static uh, approach to boosting asymmetry, uh, this may actually be natural, right? Due to process variations, cores might have different frequency. And you can simply hardwire or design the cores to have different frequencies. That's, uh, you could do both, basically. You could do it explicit or implicit, right? You could take, take advantage of the process variation, or you could design it explicitly. Now, if you want to do it dynamically, uh, there is another approach, which is uh, frequency boosting, which is implemented in all modern processors, actually, that I know of. Uh, because all modern processors implement dynamic voltage and frequency scaling to save power. And you could take advantage of that to uh, boost performance in critical sections. And this paper is one of the first ones that talks about that, actually. And they said mitigating Amdahl's law. That, but what that means is, basically, when you get to a serial bottleneck, when you have only one thread, boost the frequency and voltage significantly for the core that's executing that thread. That way, uh, you can improve the performance. So it's a pretty simple idea. Uh, but they motivate it with uh, a power budget. Basically, you want to minimize execution time of parallel programs while keeping uh, power within a fixed budget, right? You always design for a maximum power. If you exceed that, you run into voltage emergencies, for example. You could actually have reliability issues, or you could run into thermal emergencies also if it takes, if, you, if you're actually over the, over the maximum power budget for a long time. Uh, so you would like to keep the power within a fixed budget. Uh, but you can now play with different things. Energy per instruction, for example. So one way of expressing power is this way. That's what, uh, the, what the paper uh, expresses it with. Energy spent per instruction times instructions executed per second. It's a rough way, right? Now, if you know that you're in a code portion where instructions executed per second is likely to be very small, think serial code portions, then you can actually boost up that energy per instruction significantly, increase the energy sp you spend per instruction. Right? Which means that if you actually are in a scalar phase or serial phase, increase the energy per instruction because you know that uh, instructions per second will be low across the entire program, across the entire processor. Because, uh, yeah. Uh, but if you're in a parallel phase, instructions per second is likely to be very high because you have actually many, many threads executing many, many instructions. So keep the energy per instruction low so that you can maintain the fixed power budget. Does that make sense? It's a pretty simple idea, expressed in a different way, basically. You have a fixed power budget. How do you divide your power across different cores by modulating energy per instruction? OK. So the key idea is to vary the energy expended per instruction. You could think of this as, uh, actually, this is a very general formulation, right? It doesn't say anything about frequency boosting or anything. It just says you, need, you modulate the energy you spend per instruction. You could actually increase the energy per instruction in a serial phase by executing that 
uh, uh, executing that serial part in a large core. Because by definition, large core spends more energy per instruction, right? Because it has all the circuitry to get high performance, as we've seen actually uh, in, the, in, a, in a paper that I briefly mentioned last time, best of both latency and throughput. They were saying a large core spends 50 to 80x uh, the power of a small core or energy per instruction of a small core. You should look at the paper. Actually, I'm going to cover uh, some uh, data from that paper also. So basically, this is a very general formulation. How do you change the energy per instruction is dependent on the techniques you have. So one idea is for a fixed power budget, you run the sequential phase on a high energy per instruction processor and run the parallel phases on multiple low energy per instruction processors. Now you can again create these high energy per instruction versus low energy per instruction processors dynamically or statically. Okay, so if you want to do this through uh, DVFS, dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, when you have low thread parallelism, you may run a few cores at high supply voltage and high frequency, or one core at high supply voltage and high frequency if you have only one thread. Whereas if you have many threads, you run many cores at low supply voltage and low frequency. Hopefully this makes sense. So, but this is not the only way of modulating energy per instruction, right? Actually, these are some ways. This is the paper that I just mentioned. Uh, these are the EPI ranges. This is actually a little bit different from what I discussed earlier. Yeah, it's a 4 to 6, 50 to 80. It was something else. You should take a look at that paper. But basically... Uh, what is the range that you get in terms of energy per instruction if you change dif if you have different methods? And take this with a grain of salt. This is the author's expectation. The authors are from Intel, but uh, maybe they didn't look at uh, a, a huge range. Uh, they said, for example, you could modulate the energy per instruction between one to two and one to four. That's the difference you get uh, from a very high frequency versus a very low frequency uh, engine. And it takes time, of course, to change the voltage and frequency, right? To ramp up the voltage at that time, about 14 years ago, it takes 100 microseconds, they say. And that's the throttling action. You lower voltage and frequency or higher it, or make it higher. Asymmetric cores, they expect that there's a bigger range for energy per instruction. So this is actually, you can perhaps uh, get, uh, expand more energy per instruction this way, right? And time to change it is actually lower, as you can see, migrating. Again, this, take this with a grain of salt. Uh, you need to switch between different modes. You switch the program to a large core or the thread to a large core. It takes time to do that. And with some assumptions, migrating 256 kilobyte L2 cache, that's their assumption, uh, they expect it takes this amount of time, right? Of course, you can have variable size core. Again, they don't describe exactly what it is, but uh, they say uh, energy per instruction range could be one to, uh, from one to two. This is the more interesting part. This is a little bit weird, right? Going from <laughs> one to one, then you, you don't have a trade-off. And speculation control. Uh, so variable size core, as you can see, uh, it's much quicker. You basically reconfigure the core slightly uh, such that you have uh, a more powerful core or reduce the capacity of processor resources, as they say. Uh, or you could do speculation control, basically stop fetching, for example. We talked about this when we talked about branch prediction. If you have not, many, not, not a lot of confident predictions, uh, then you basically stop fetching from that, from that uh, thread. And they expect that uh, the energy per instruction range of this is relatively small compared to the other ones, as you can see. Uh, you, you just have a 40% range, uh, whether or not you fetch instructions. So you don't save a lot of energy over here, but uh, it takes very, this is very quick to do. So there are trade-offs, as you can see. How fast you can change the energy per instruction, and what is the range you get in terms of energy per instruction. Make sense? OK. And you can read that paper. It's actually a good paper. It's uh, relatively early in its time. OK. So this is already implemented, as we've discussed, in all processors that I know of that are interesting, at least. Uh, so there are advantages and disadvantages to it. Advantages of boosting frequency, at least. Uh, a specific way of changing energy per instruction. It's very simple to implement. You don't need to design a new core, right? And that's exactly why this is implemented today. Uh, parallel throughput does not degrade when thread level parallelism is high because you really uh, are adapting the frequency. Uh, you can actually adapt the frequency to much, much lower to uh, uh, stay within the power budget. And you can preserve the locality of the boosted thread because you're not moving it somewhere else, right? In the designs that we've discussed in heterogeneous designs, uh, heterogeneous core designs, we moved the thread somewhere else. 
and that changed the locality of it. And we discussed locality a lot. We're going to discuss more today. Of course, this has disadvantages also, or limitations. And one big limitation is boosting frequency doesn't help you if your thread is memory bound, right? If you have a lot of memory operations, increasing the frequency of the add instruction doesn't help you a lot. It may help you slightly, but not really a lot. And it doesn't reduce something else, right? So this is a limited approach because, it, you know, yes, maybe it helps the computation by increasing the frequency, but the cycles per instruction doesn't change, right? Frequency is not the only thing, only determinant of your performance. Remember the performance equation? For your execution time is equal to the number of instructions you've executed. You execute times uh, the instructions per cycle times the cycle time. Right? So you're only playing with the cycle time by changing the frequency. Whereas if you actually design a large core, you can change the frequency as well as cycles per instruction at the same time. So you have much more range in that. Make sense? OK. And as the previous uh, slide showed, changing frequency and voltage actually can take longer than switching to a large core. This depends on your design, but the uh, difficult part is usually ramping up the voltage. When you're going from a lower voltage to a higher voltage, uh, it takes time to ramp up the circuit. Yes? Well, increasing the voltage enables you to increase the frequency. Yeah. Hmm? Exactly, exactly, yeah. You have more power, basically. Increasing the voltage, of course, uh, if you remember the power equation, the power is proportional to the activity factor you have times the capacitance times voltage squared times frequency. So if you actually increase both frequency and voltage, you're actually getting a cubic increase in energy. But it may be a good trade-off, depending on what you get. OK. You have a question? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. That's the difficulty, right? Uh, I mean, depends. It's it's not functioning. Yes, <laughs> basically, you have some dead dead cycles to ramp up the voltage and frequency. That's true for the uh, other approaches also, though, right? Because when you're migrating, for example, a thread from a small core to a large core, it takes time as well. And that was the uh, ra uh, that, uh, that this is this paper's estimation of how long it will take. Yes. Well, I'm not sure exactly when they implement it. So, uh, yeah, dynamic voltage and frequency scaling has been there before. But the, uh, th this particular one, the turbo boost, what they call... So how do you, the question is, how do you use it, right? <laughs> so the support has been there for a long time, but the, this way of using it has been implemented later. later yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's talk about memory latency tolerance. So one of the issues over here, as you can see, is uh, if your thread is memory bound, you don't have a whole lot of choice uh, with uh, voltage and frequency scaling. But if you actually have a large core, that large core may be much more tolerant of memory latency, right? Because it can, have, it can do a lot of prefetching, for example. It can have bigger caches. Uh, or it can have mechanisms to tolerate latency. And we're going to talk about uh, those today. Because in the end, if your critical section is if your bottleneck is memory bound, there's not much you can do by changing the frequency. And that's uh, the problem with a lot of these techniques, actually, uh, in practice. OK, so we're going to switch to memory latency tolerance and prefetching. And we're going to cover a lot of papers uh, that are really close to my heart. <laughs> I really enjoy these lectures. So if you have questions, please ask and some of my earlier papers as well. <laughs> OK, let's, uh, basically, if you've taken digital circuits, we've covered some of latency tolerance. We talked about that earlier as well. But uh, we talked about out-of-order execution quite a bit. An out-of-order execution processor, remember, it executes instructions out of the uh, program order. Program order is sequential in a von Neumann machine. An out-of-order execution processor uh, 
executes the programs uh, in, uh, in a data flow order. It figures out which instructions are dependent uh, and which instructions are independent and tries to execute independent instructions concurrently. Right? As a result, it can tolerate the latency of multi-cycle operations. So if you have an ad that takes five cycles, you can look ahead and execute independent instructions while that ad is in progress. You don't wait for that ad to finish. Right? That's the beauty of auto-order execution. And you should really, uh, if, you, if you want to brush up on auto-order execution, it's mechanics, which you don't really need to know exactly how it works here, but I would definitely encourage you to do that by watching the Digital Circuits Lecture, and we should probably add a link uh, to that. Okay, so it does so by buffering instructions in reservation stations and reorder buffer. If you remember the reorder buffer, uh, you execute instructions in out-of-order, but then you need to record them, and you need to report the results in program order, right? because the programmer expects in-order execution. You, you don't report results in out, of, uh, out of the program order. So that's the purpose of the reorder buffer, and we covered that again in digital circuits. And reservation stations are mechanisms where you can execute instructions. You can figure out which instructions to execute when. Right? You, track, you keep track of the data dependencies between instructions, and if an instruction finishes, it wakes up dependent instructions. Right? That's how it works. And uh, instruction window, we defined it as hardware resources. Uh, all the hardware resources that are needed to buffer all decoded, but not yet retired, finished instructions. Basically, all of those instructions that are in the machine that are not finished, but they're, that are pending, if you will, that are not uh, yet ready to be reported to the software, are in the instruction window. Does that make sense? Everything's clear? Basically, you fetch instructions in program order, you execute them out of order, and you retire or finish instructions in program order again. Which means that there is all of this buffering that you need to do in the engine uh, so that you, don't, uh, you keep all of the instructions that are decoded but not yet retired, not yet committed. Okay. Now, the problem happens when an instruction takes very long. So if you have an instruction that takes 500 cycles, let's say, even 500 is relatively low today, if you see instructions that are taking thousands of cycles because they may access a remote memory location. Let's assume that we don't want to stall the processor at all. How, long, how large of an instruction window do you, need to, do you need to continue decoding? Let's do this exercise. So you have a 500 cycle uh, instruction and you're fetching four instructions per cycle. If you don't want to stall at all, you need to be able to buffer 500 times 4, 2,000 instructions right, in the processor. If this is 1,000 and if your width is 8, you need to be able to buffer 8,000 instructions in hardware. Now this quickly gets very complicated because buffering 8,000 instructions and figuring out dependencies between them is expensive. So the latency tolerance of auto order execution is really dependent on how large your instruction window is. So if you can buffer two instructions, that's your latency tolerance, right? You won't be able to tolerate uh, much latency. So this, is a, this has been a big design problem, and this is one of the reasons why it's actually difficult to improve the single thread performance, uh, because of these very long latency instructions. You need a large out-of-order execution window, but if you actually try to build that, it takes a lot of effort, as we will discuss. So let's take a look at these stalls uh, due to long latency instructions. By the way, I'm motivating this in terms of auto order execution, but the problem is much more severe in a processor like what you're building, what you built in the first two labs, right? Pipeline processor has no latency tolerance almost because it doesn't have this notion of instruction window, right? You don't have, uh, you just have the pipeline. You don't really execute instructions out of order. So if you get a 500 uh, cycle latency instruction in your pipeline, you're going to be stalling for a really long time and doing nothing at all. Whereas an out-of-order processor, if you have this large window, you can tr figure out which instructions to execute while actually you're waiting for this instruction. Right? Okay, so the problem is much more severe in an in-order processor. Okay, uh, so when a long latency instruction is not complete, it blocks progress, basically. It blocks retirement. You cannot continue forward because you need to maintain precise state. That's exactly what uh, is maintained by this reorder buffer, right? The programmer needs to be able to see the instructions in program order when you, you don't retire out of order. If you actually were able to retire instructions in any order, then this problem wouldn't exist, actually, but then the programmer would go crazy, right? 
because they've written the program in a sequential manner and they expect sequential execution. What you're giving them is some random execution order, perhaps, right? Okay, so it's really due to the sequential model again. If the programmer were somehow able to reason about the data flow ordering and could deal with any state that they get, then maybe this problem goes away, but it's very difficult for the... Uh, again, the, this trade-off is really, again, between the programmer and the hardware. You could make the programmer go crazy and get rid of the problem, but then no one will use your computer. IBM 3691, which was the first out of order, but which was not the first, which was actually the second out of order processor of its time, it was unusable because of this reason. It implemented out of order execution, but it didn't have precise exceptions. So a programmer got not completely random orderings, but a lot of different orderings than the sequential execution order. By the way, the first auto-order execution processor was really CDC 6600, Control Data Corporation 6600. This was a small group of engineers that were competing with IBM to build the supercomputer of the day. And they did auto order execution in a very different way, uh, which we're not going to get into. You can find it in the papers. But again, it suffered from a similar problem. Okay, so if, if a long latency instruction blocks the retirement, incoming instructions fill the instruction window, fill your pipeline, for example, in your simple machine, and once the window is full, the processor cannot fetch new instructions into the window, cannot decode new instructions. And this is called a full window stall. In a pipeline machine, basically, you, you stall the pipeline, right? In an out-of-order machine, because you cannot put new instructions into this huge buffer, you have a full window stall. And a full window stall prevents the processor from making progress in the execution of the program. Basically, it limits your latency tolerance. So let's take a look at the, an example. I'm visualizing an out-of-order processor's instruction window this way. You have eight entries over here, and you keep track of the oldest. When the oldest instruction is not ready, you cannot uh, retire instructions. So let's say you get this load. It's an L2 cache miss, or L3 cache miss, whatever level. It takes hundreds of cycles. And then you keep fetching instructions. This branch is dependent on the load, and the other instructions are independent of the load, as you can see. And assume that the branch is correctly predicted. <laughs> That will be another issue. So if, if the branch is correctly predicted, this, these are on your correct path. But you cannot retire these instructions, even though you have already executed them, because this load is taking 500 cycles. In the meantime, these instructions are executing. But you cannot retire them, because you need to obey that sequential semantics. Right? And as a result, you cannot fetch the younger instructions. You cannot put them into the window, because there is no space in the instruction window. If there was space, then you would have, you would have been able to uh, execute this one as well. Yes? Yeah, we're, we're looking at single thread right now, yeah. This is, don't, don't think about multiple threads at the moment. Okay, so the processor stalls until the L2 miss is serviced. So the goal here is actually to improve single thread performance. That's a good, good point. So uh, if you have a multi-thread machine, like fine-grained multi-threaded, you would be switching between different threads, right? But then your performance would not improve for each thread. You actually have, as we discussed earlier, you have a very conscious choice in a multi-threaded machine. You give up single thread performance to improve multi-threaded throughput. Okay, so long latency cache misses are responsible for most full window stalls. I actually sh showed this data to you in the past when I motivated uh, processing in memory, right? This is actually data from a relatively faithful model of a processor uh, circa 2002 or so. But similar results exist today also. There's a recent Google paper uh, in ISCA 2015 that examined all of their data center workloads. And they, they showed that on average across a very large number of workloads that they execute in their data centers, the processor stalls 40 to 50% of the time waiting for data. And this is a similar result. Uh, this is on memory intensive workloads uh, that were used to design Intel's processors at the time. Uh, it's a simulation model. But basically, this shows that the processor uh, that we're looking at stalls 68% of its time. And most of those stalls are, full window stalls are because of L2 misses. L2 was the latest, th last level of the cache hierarchy here. And you can imagine what the other ones are. It could be long dependency chains, for example, right? You could have a floating point operation, floating point multiply that's dependent on a floating point multiply that's dependent on a floating point multiply, 
each of which may take 50 cycles. And that may actually cause a lot of stalls also. Right? OK. So basically, memory latency is long. That's really, this is really uh, why this is happening. Right? And it's not easy to reduce it, although we've seen uh, this is one of the reasons why I actually put memory earlier, because that affects the design of everything else in the system. And we looked at methods for reducing DRAM latency, which some of which uh, you may remember, tiered latency DRAM is an example of heterogeneous DRAM, for example. But even if you reduce memory latency, it's still long. <laughs> and this is, uh, again, very fundamental, right? It's the fundamental capacity latency trade-off. If you want to design large memories, they're going to be long latency. You may try to optimize them, but they're going to be long latency, fundamentally. And also, contention for memory increases the latency. So if you have a multi-core system, the latencies, because of queuing, uh, increases, and we've talked about the memory interference problem, that actually becomes worse for single thread performance. If you have a really critical thread, now it's waiting longer and longer. So memory latencies are increasing, even though people are trying to reduce the uh, latency to access. OK, how do we tolerate stalls due to memory? Uh, there are two major approaches, reducing or eliminating stalls. We're going to talk about that. Prefetching is one example. Or tolerate the effect of a stall when it happens. So ideally, for example, the first one, I'd like to think of that as you are proactive uh, such that you never get to stalls. Right? Prefetching is one example of that. Caching can be thought about reducing or eliminating stalls also, because the first time you take a cache miss, the next time, hopefully, you won't stall for that uh, block. But when a stall happens, you need to tolerate the effect of a stall when it happens also. So there are four fundamental techniques to achieve these. Uh, I'm ignoring processing in memory for now. Uh, four fundamental techniques in uh, core design. So you cache, you prefetch, you do multi-threading, or you do out-of-order execution. And many techniques have been developed to make these four fundamental techniques more effective in tolerating memory latency. Now let's take a look at these, actually, uh, very quickly. We've covered caching. We've covered multi-threading, and we've, in the past, covered out-of-order execution. And I would strongly encourage you to brush, the, uh, brush up on this. So caching, it's very widely used. Clearly, every processor uses it. It's simple, effective, but it's inefficient, as we've seen. Right? Actually, a lot of the blocks are dead blocks, as we've seen. We've tried to eliminate that problem. Even after you eliminate that problem, a lot of the blocks are still dead blocks in the cache. Uh, and not all applications and phases exhibit temporal or spatial locality, especially with uh, new applications that we see, large graphs, for example, a lot of them are random access, even though there is some spatial locality in that also. So clearly this is good, but even despite the cache, presence of caches, we have a lot of stalls. Prefetching, uh, initially it was also implemented in IBM 3691, actually. Uh, it works well for regular memory access patterns, and we're going to cover that soon. And th the difficulty is irregular access pattern prefetching is difficult. How do you predict what, ac uh, what address you're going to access. We're going to talk about a lot of clever, creative approaches to actually prefetch irregular access patterns also, but I'll leave that uh, for, uh, for the next lecture or at the end of this lecture. So it turns out this is actually very bandwidth intensive also. It turns out it can be very inaccurate. Multi-threading, as you pointed out, or as you've alluded to, uh, it works well if there are multiple threads, but if you don't have multiple threads, then you have a problem. Now, there's a really interesting effort uh, in improving single thread performance using multi threading hardware. And this is an ongoing research effort. How do you actually uh, take a thread that's single thread and partition it and use multi threaded hardware to improve the performance of it? Art of order execution, this is actually, or data flow, this is actually the best way we know in tolerating irregular accesses, irregular cache miss, or exploiting irregular parallelism. If you don't have any regularity to capture, you just basically try to figure out what are your dependencies and execute instructions that are independent of each other. And this is good at tolerating cache misses that cannot be prefetched. But the problem is, as we've discussed, it requires extensive hardware resources for tolerating long latencies. Right? If you don't want to stall, you may actually need a 2,000 entry instruction window. Today's instruction windows are on the order of 200, 256, let's say. I think they've also stopped publishing some of these things. Does anybody know? <laughs> OK. So we'll talk about run execution that alleviates this problem, as we will see today. OK. So what's run ahead? Uh, let me give you uh, the basic idea. So you have this L2 mist that takes hundreds of cycles. And you get a full window stall if you have a small window, right? 
And you cannot put in this instruction into the window. Now, if you had one more entry in the instruction window, you would be able to put that in, right? And if this was a cache miss, you would start servicing this cache miss very early. Now, the problem is you have a small window, you get a cache miss, you stall, you fetch another instruction. After this cache miss is done, you retire this one, right? Once this cache miss is done after 500 cycles, let's say, you retire this one, now you can actually fetch this one into the window because you've created one space. But now this is going to stall again because it's going to take 500 cycles too. So you basically stall, don't do computation for a while, and then your stall gets unblocked because you can retire this instruction, but then you stall again. But then you stall again. Assume that this is repeating all the time, right? You have a problem, right? But if you were able to add one more entry into the instruction window, you would actually parallelize those cache misses, service them in parallel. Okay. So what if you had a large window? That's one question you may have. And with simulation, you can do anything you want, right? You could simulate the 2048 entry window. And you figure out that uh, your cache miss related stalls reduces significantly. You still have a lot, actually, as you can see over here. But your performance increases a lot also. This is averaged across a large number of applications. It's about 147. And some of these are actually really diff these are single threaded workloads that are really difficult to uh, parallelize. So as you can see, you can improve performance, execution time reduces, and the amount of time you're spending on stalls reduces also. Now here, the non-stall time increases, which is interesting. What do you, why do you think that is? It's a good performance analysis question. <laughs> You've increased the window size. You can actually put more instructions into the window. You reduce the stalls. That's what you expect. You're not stalling as much. Your performance also improves. Execution time reduces. But you're doing more computation than you were doing otherwise. Yes? Exactly, yeah. Exactly. The problem is really branch mispredictions, right? <laughs> if actually this, if, if I were simulating a machine that had perfect branch prediction, no speculation, or, or everything perfect in speculation, you would expect the screen portion to be exactly the same, right? Because you have equal amount of work instructions in both. But here, you're doing more stuff that is useless. Well, we'll get back to that useless part. You're doing more stuff that on speculation. More instructions, basically. And you can see that it's almost, uh, maybe not twice, but 1.7x, right? Okay, so that's always a trade-off, actually. If you increase the window, your branch predictor becomes much more important. Clearly, if you want to really take advantage of a 2048 entry window, you need a perfect branch predictor, or a much better branch predictor. And if you actually have that, I wish I had that over here, but it's in the paper that you're going to read, I think. It goes down to somewhere here. <laughs> okay. Okay, basically, uh, if you want auto word execution to be really effective, uh, you want a good branch predictor, but we're going to ignore that for now. We've discussed that a lot. <laughs> uh, you, uh, you want large instruction windows also. The problem is as main memory latency increases, your instruction window size also should also increase to fully tolerate the latency. But if you actually want to build a large instruction window, it's a challenging task. Because as you increase the size of the instruction window, your energy and power consumption actually increases. This is really the limiter of single thread performance in the way we exploit it today. Because to find the independent instructions, you need to, whenever, whenever an instruction produces a result, you need to figure out which other instructions need that result. And the way it's done in existing processors, even though it's very optimized today, usually you broadcast a tag, and all of the instructions that are dependent wait for the tag bro broadcast. And that, that's called the tag matching logic. And that tag matching logic needs to span 2,000 instructions. Right? That's a problem. And you need to also st uh, buffer loads and stores. This is actually one of the more difficult parts of designing the engine. If you have a store instruction and a dependent load instruction, how does the load instruction know whether it should get the result from the cache or a store that is in the processor that didn't update the cache? Right. Because you're not supposed to update the cache out of order also. Right. It's all sequential execution. And this, it turns out you actually need to have a lot of stores in flight 
And whenever you have an incoming load, it needs to check the store buffer. And that's a very expensive logic, because you're now trying to match the address of the load to the address of the, all of the stores on the machine. And these addresses are large. It's not a simple address match. You're trying to match the address range of the store, uh, load to the address range of each store. And you're trying to find the youngest match. So it's really a prioritized content associative memory that's range-based. So that's actually the real limiter of the design and out-of-order execution processors today. And that's one of the reasons why people have given up almost in improving the size of the instruction window today. But if you find a new way of doing it, you will probably find a breakthrough in improving single-thread performance. Uh, of course, if you have these large structures, now this goes against your short cycle time, because all of these latencies to figure out which instructions to execute next, which instructions are dependent on each other, they take time. And clearly, this makes the design much more complex. And uh, out-of-order processors are much, much harder to verify and validate uh, and design compared to simple in-order processors. That was one of the, actually, motivations for Sun Niagara. We discussed Sun Niagara, right? The really simple, wimpy in-order processor uh, that was fine-grained multi-thread. It didn't even have a branch predictor. Right? They said, instead of these out-of-order machines, we're just going to have a really simple machine, and we're just going to design it quickly. It's true they did design it quickly, but it suffered a lot in single-thread performance. And then later, they tried to, they added actually run-ahead execution to make it closer to out-of-order execution performance. That's why, that's, why, that's why we're going to talk about run-ahead also. OK, so as I said, this is one of the major research issues today. It's really pushing the boundary of the state of the art in out-of-order execution. How do we achieve the benefits of a large window with a small one, or in a simpler way, or with a different paradigm? I don't know. But I'll give you what we know. Uh, and how do we efficiently tolerate memory latency with the machinery of out-of-order execution and a small instruction window? I'll give you the answer, or at least whatever we know in the answer uh, to this question in the next uh, part. And we're going to exploit what we've discussed in the past, basically memory level parallelism. right? And you've seen this before. The idea is to find and service multiple cache misses in parallel so that the processor stalls only once for all misses. So this is an isolated miss. You pay the full cost. These are two parallel misses. They're parallelized, so uh, you don't pay the full cost of both misses, right? And if you go back to this picture uh, quickly, basically, if we had one more entry over here, we would start servicing this miss in parallel with this miss. As a result, we would overlap the latencies and tolerate the latency of this miss. But if we don't have that one more entry over here, both misses will look like these isolated misses that happen serially, and they stall the processor. OK, so how do you generate multiple misses? We've seen out-of-order execution, multi-threading, prefetching. Well, we were going to see prefetching, but we're going to talk about run-ahead uh, right now. So this is really uh, a technique to exploit. Uh, let me see what time it is. Oh, we still have a good time. Uh, the idea here is you have this out-of-order execution window, or you're stalling for a miss. How can we actually? make the best use of that stall. Uh, we'd like to obtain the memory level parallelism benefits of a large instruction window. So when the old instruction, oh, this is actually applicable to in-order, out-of-order, it doesn't matter, any kind of processor. As long as you're stalling, when this oldest instruction is a long latency cache miss, you say, I'm going to checkpoint the architectural state and enter a special, purely speculative processing mode. What does checkpointing the architectural state mean? You basically checkpoint the program counter of the oldest instruction and anything else, uh, the register file, anything else that you need to get back to that state. Because what we're going to do is we're going to execute ahead in the program and we're going to go back as if nothing happened. So we enter run ahead mode. In run ahead mode, the goal is just to speculatively execute instructions without the intent of committing the results to the architectural state. The purpose is to generate prefetches. And to be able to do that, you need to ensure that the L2MIS dependent instructions or long latency instructions are marked invalid. That means that I don't have the data for them, so I'm not going to deal with them at all. I'm going to drop them. And hopefully this way, what will happen is that the oldest instruction, if we go back over here, now we have this long latency stall. We checkpoint the architectural state over here. And we say, oh, this load 
is an long latency cache miss, so I'm going to mark it invalid, and now I can get rid of it. I can move it out of my window. Now I've created one space in my instruction window, right? Now I can bring in this younger instruction into the instruction window. Does that make sense? So mark the invalid L2 miss instructions and their dependents invalid. So the next instruction will be marked invalid also because it's dependent on L2 miss. These instructions, they already executed, but you're going to pseudo retire them as we will discuss. So you're basically going to kick out the instructions from the instruction window because you've checkpointed the architectural state. These are not going to update the checkpointed architectural state. They're going to update the processor structures as they were updating before. And this way you can bring in more instructions into the window. And if they happen to be L2 misses, you generate prefetches for them. And then you mark them invalid. And then you drop them. You basically get them out of the window. This way you can use the same window for getting many instructions into the machine and getting them out quickly because you're not waiting for L2 misses. And get generating prefetches for those instructions that happen to miss in the caches. Instruction caches, L2 caches, whatever caches you have. And when this original L2 miss instruction is done, what you do is you say, oh, okay, I was waiting for this because I recorded it, right? You need to record some state also. Uh, you say, I was waiting for this instruction. I was doing run ahead execution because I was stalled for this instruction. Now the data is back. So what I'm going to do is flush everything in the pipeline, restore the checkpoint to the architectural state, the register file, and the program counter, and I will start, I'll fetch this instruction again as if nothing happened. Does that make sense? I'll give you a pictorial view of this also. Nothing happened from the architectural perspective, really. You just didn't stall for this instruction. But from the microarchitectural perspective, hopefully you executed a lot of instructions ahead, and you prefetched a lot of data into the machine. OK, let me give you a pictorial perspective of this. I'm not giving you the exact machinery of how to do that, but we can talk about that also. So basically, during run-ahead mode, you speculate the pre-execute instructions. When the run-ahead run -ahead mode ends, when the original miss returns, original long latency load instruction gets serviced, at that point, you restore the checkpoint, restore the program counter, restore the architectural register file, and resume normal execution. Let me give you the uh, pictorial perspective. So ideally, you want perfect caches, right? All instructions hit, and you're happy. Everything is green, as you can see. <laughs> If you have a small window machine, this is what happens. You get a cache miss, long latency cache miss. And you can overlap some latency because you have a small instruction window. But after that, you start stalling because your instruction window is full. And you stall for a long time. And then after the miss is complete, you can go back and keep executing because you unblock the instruction window. The oldest instruction can retire now. But later, you get another cache miss after you start computing. And then the same thing happens. The instruction window gets blocked soon after, and you stall for a long time. Now, in a runhead processor, you compute. You get a long latency cache miss. After some point, this becomes the oldest instruction in the window. Now, you checkpoint the architectural state when it becomes the oldest instruction in the window. And you say, I'm going to start recycling my window meaning I, I'm going to get rid of this instruction and get into this run-ahead mode. In the run-ahead mode, you keep executing instructions without stalling for long latency cache misses, which means that you'll execute a lot ahead, and you will discover this L2 cache miss, and you will start that L2 cache miss a long time before you would have started if you had a small window. And at the end of run-ahead, so basically when this miss that you that caused entry into this run-ahead mode returns back from memory. You flush the pipeline, so you pay some penalty. Refetch this load one. Now it hits in the cache because you've serviced it. And then you start computation. Sometime later, this miss gets serviced. So you've seen that you're, you have overlapped some miss, uh, miss latencies over here. And you overlap the computation with the miss latency also over here. And when you actually get to this 
load two in real execution, not run ahead mode execution. It hits in the cache, and you don't need to stall for it. As a result, you save a lot of cycles. And you save cycles because instead of stalling over here for the long latency cache miss, you have done speculative execution. You pre-executed the program and prefetched these misses that would otherwise occur in the future in the program and exploited memory level parallelism. So this combines a lot of the concepts that we've seen in the past. And you could actually come up with more examples that would save you a lot more cycles, as you can see. Okay. High level idea is good. Okay, let's talk about some mechanics, basically. Uh, so let's talk about the benefits. So instead of stalling during this long latency cache miss, and if you think about an in order processor, the same thing applies actually. Instead of, instead of waiting for a long latency cache miss in an in order processor, you do the same thing, right? Actually, it's even easier to implement an in order processor. Instead of stalling during an L2 cache miss, you pre execute these instructions, loads and stores, independent of the L2 miss instructions, generate very accurate data prefetches. Because you're really executing the program, right? As if it will execute in the future. And this is true for both irregular and regular access patterns. And instructions that are on the predicted program path are prefetched into the instruction or trace cache or the L2 cache, whatever you have, because you're actually going through the program path that you're going to take soon. You're following the branch predictor. And also, if you have a hardware prefetcher, well, clearly you should have a branch predictor. Those tables are also trained using future access information. So let's go into uh, the mechanism a little bit. So entry into run ahead mode, we've discussed that you need to checkpoint the architectural register state. But the paper you're going to read actually talks about checkpointing some microarchitectural state also. And we've discussed this before. You need to checkpoint the global history register, for example, to make sure that when you get back, you, start, you predict branches accurately. You need to checkpoint the return address stack so that when you get back, you don't keep getting return mispredictions, dot, dot, dot. And of course, you need to also record the cache miss that caused the run ahead, uh, entry into run ahead mode because when the cache miss returns, you're going to get exit from run ahead mode. Let's talk about the instruction processing in run ahead mode. Uh, so exit from run ahead mode is also obvious, hopefully. You restore the architectural state from the checkpoint and fetch uh, the instruction. So instruction processing in run ahead mode is the same as normal instruction processing. You don't change anything in the pipeline except for two things. Uh, one is it's purely speculative. The software visible register and memory state is not updated. This actually makes it easy to implement because you could actually do nothing in this mode and it'll still be correct, right? Uh, of course, you want to do something in this mode, but it, make, it's, it, it lifts a lot of the burden on, from the designer, the fact that it's purely speculative. Uh, you're never going to retire anything uh, that you execute during this time. Uh, and L2 misdependent instructions are identified and treated specially. Uh, they're marked invalid, they're quickly removed from the instruction window, and their results are not trusted. You're not going to do anything with those invalid results, basically. Uh, so removal of the instruction from uh, the instruction window actually still happens in order because we don't want to change in anything in the machinery. So you still remove instructions uh, when uh, you move an instruction from the window uh, when it becomes the oldest instruction, but uh, when an L2 misdepend beco instruction becomes the oldest, it's marked invalid, so you remove it immediately. So there are two types of results that are produced, invalid and valid. Invalid, you can think of it as dependent on an L2 miss. Invalid results are marked using invalid bits everywhere. So for example, if you load a register, uh, register 2, if, you, if, you, if the first instruction that causes entry into run-ahead mode is loading some value into register 2, you get an L2 miss. You have, a, you have a single bit associated with each register that says this is invalid. Whenever you get an L2 miss, you set that bit saying this is invalid. Because you don't have the data. You're waiting for the data. You just mark it invalid, right? Another option would be predicting that value, saying, oh, this is 0. <laughs> That's actually interesting also, and we can talk about we will, we will talk about something related to that. But let's assume for now that you're going to mark them special. This is also called bogus bits, and this is actually used in a lot of processors for other reasons also. Whenever a value is not available, you mark it as invalid or bogus. And these values are not used for prefetching and branch resolution because you don't really know the value. Uh, okay, and whenever an instruction becomes oldest, it is examined for what I call pseudo-retirement here. 
It's really not retirement, because the essence of retirement of an instruction is updating the architectural state. We're not going to update the architectural state. We're just going to remove uh, the instruction window. We're, going to update the, we're, going, we're not going to update the checkpoint, basically. The checkpoint stays nice. We're, going, we're not going to update the memory also. So an invalid instruction is removed from the window immediately. If the oldest instruction is invalid, it's removed from the window immediately. If it's valid, meaning it's not dependent on L2MS, it's removed when it completes execution. This way you can actually execute independent instructions, L2MS independent instructions. And when an instruction is removed from the window, uh, it frees its allocated resources. Everything else, it, everything it's reserved in the machine, it frees them. As a result, um, you can bring in new instructions into the window. And I'm not going to talk about this, but you can read the paper. Well, maybe I'll talk about this. Okay. Uh, it's a little bit important. <laughs> uh, so how do you do the store load communication if we're not going to update memory? Right? Well, uh, if you have a store instruction that's writing to a memory location, uh, this may be useful, actually, to communicate, keep it somewhere, right, that data, such that when a later load instruction comes in run-ahead mode, it checks that buffer and gets the data. So we actually add something special. This is one way of doing it. There are multiple ways of doing it. You could actually, you could actually have something in the cache and mark it speculative, mark it invalid, right? or, or mark it especially, uh, saying that, oh, this is really not a cache line. It's really a cache line that was stored into during run-ahead mode. Right? There are other ways of doing it. But let's, let's look at one way of doing it. Uh, if you pseudo-retire a store in the speculative mode, you write your data and the invalid status to a dedicated memory called runhead cache. It's called a cache because it looks like a cache. It's not really caching anything other than communicating results. Its purpose is to communicate data through memory in the speculative mode. We don't want to update memory. We want to communicate between these speculative instructions. And a dependent load during runhead mode reads its data from the runhead cache. Basically, it needs to check runhead cache, the store buffer, as well as the regular cache. If the data is in the runhead cache, it gets it from the runhead cache. And there's a priority between those, of course, which you can see in the paper. And the good thing in any of this is none of this needs to be correct, because you're not going to report any of this to the software, right? You could actually produce all kinds of garbage here, as long as you make sure you're not updating the architectural state. So you can actually uh, relax the correctness requirements and make the design simple. But of course, if you're... Uh, if, you, if you're correct, if, if this affects your performance, it's a good idea to make it correct. So again, remember, your purpose is to run ahead and generate cache misses. If something is not benefiting for that purpose, you could actually get rid of them. The fact that you're not maintaining correctness helps. OK, so one issue in run ahead mode is handling branches that are invalid, that are dependent on an L2 miss. Remember that picture, load, and then branch, and the branch was dependent on the load. Now, if that branch is mispredicted, you have a problem. So if you have a mispredicted uh, L2 dependent branch, it causes the processor to stay on the wrong program path until the end of run ahead execution, which may be 500 cycles later. Whereas if you think about a, a processor with a small window, you stall after some point, right? Even, even though you're on the wrong path, you're not going to do any more execution because you stall, because you run out of resources. So this may be problematic. We're going to get back to this. Uh, it's not actually bad. Wrong path is actually more useful for prefetching uh, than not useful or harmful. And we'll see that. Uh, but if the branch is valid, they're resolved. And if they're mispredicted, they initiate recovery. So it's just like normal execution. If the branch is predicted correctly and valid, no problem. If the branch is uh, valid but mispredicted, you take a branch misprediction while in run-ahead mode. OK, so this is my ugly picture <laughs> from a long time ago <laughs> of what you need to add uh, to a Pentium 4-like processor to actually get this working. You don't need to know the exact details, but it's relatively small, as you can see. You need these inval bits in the register files. Uh, you need these inval bits in the store buffer. And you need this runhead cache to communicate between stores and loads. And you need, of course, some checkpointing. Uh, checkpoint. Uh, and it turns out, actually, a Pentium 4 already took a lot of checkpoints. You just need another checkpoint. Uh, you, don't, you don't need a lot of space uh, for this one. So one way of, uh, we, we, we didn't cover how to checkpoint our uh, state, but uh, you don't need to copy the contents of a register file, for example. You just need to have pointers 
to the registers that are checkpointed such that no one updates those pointers. So you could actually uh, simply checkpoint the pointers. OK, but you can read the paper if you would like to understand more. As, as I said, out-of-order processors today are much more complicated than uh, we can cover uh, a lot in a lecture. OK, let's talk about uh, advantages and disadvantages and limitations. Uh, so it turns out this is very accurate. If you read the paper, you'll see that uh, the accuracy is more than 90%. And inaccuracy really comes from the wrong program path sometimes uh, because it follows the program path. So prefetches data for, uh, uh, it's accurate prefetches for both data and instructions to all cache levels. It's simple to implement. Most of the hardware is already built in, as you, as you saw in the uh, previous picture. And we will cover something called pre-execution-based prefetching mechanisms later in this lecture, on the next lecture, probably in the next lecture. This is one form of pre-execution-based prefetching mechanism. Basically, whenever you get, uh, the general idea of pre-execution-based prefetching is you spawn a thread to do prefetching. Now, if you think about this, we're really spawning a thread here, except the hardware is doing it, <laughs> right? Checkpointing the architectural state implicitly means that you're creating two different contexts. One context you're putting on the side, that's the main program, and the context that I have is the speculative program now, and I'm going to go back to the main program. So you can really think of this as a very, very simple way of spawning a thread. And you have, in the run-ahead mode, you're executing a separate, purely speculative thread. It's just very fast. So the general idea of pre-execution-based prefetching is, you could actually think about a software thread now also. As, remember, as I said, you can, anything you can do in software, you can do in hardware, and vice versa. So you can say, oh, I'm going to spawn a thread that prefetches data for me in this other core. Now, uh, we're going to cover that in more detail. Uh, but this is a very low-cost way of doing pre-execution-based prefetching because we use the same thread context as the main thread. There's no waste of context, but you still need the checkpoint, of course. There is some additional cost. And there's no need to construct a pre-execution thread. So usually the software-based methods, as we will see, uh, you want to construct a thread to prefetch data. Here, your thread is the main program. You keep executing the main program, right? You don't change anything in the software. Okay. So, but some of these actually lead to disadvantages also. One disadvantage is clearly extra executed instructions, right? You can get into run-ahead mode, you keep executing for 500 cycles, lots of instructions, you may never discover a cache miss. No instruction misses in the cache. That sounds bad, right? You wasted a lot of energy for no benefit. And we're going to talk about how to fix that. Uh, well, this is actually a problem as we discussed with any large window mechanism. If you want to keep executing ahead, you're limited, you're always limited by branch prediction accuracy. That's why branch prediction is so important. Uh, one problem is this works only if cache misses or loads are dependent on each other, right? If the next cache miss is, uh, sorry, independent of each other. If the next cache miss is dependent on the previous cache miss, now you have a problem. You cannot prefetch that. And we're going to try to fix that also. And effectiveness is, uh, I mean, this is saying essentially the same thing almost here, but not exactly. Uh, so if your effectiveness is limited by the available memory level parallelism. Your memory level parallelism is low if things are dependent on each other. And your memory level parallelism may be low because things may be very separated from each other. Actually, it turns out a lot of the programs exhibit the behavior. Uh, whenever you get a cache miss, you get a lot of cache misses also. And then you have some time where you don't have a whole lot of cache misses, and then you get to another cluster of cache misses. So cache misses are relatively clustered. And if you think about this, this makes some sense from the program perspective because you go into some other working set, and whenever you change your working set, you get a lot of cache misses. It's not always true, of course. Programs have all kinds of weird behavior. But this is one way of reasoning about uh, the clustering of the memory level parallelism. So if you're in a point where you don't have a cluster, for example, uh, you have a problem. OK. I don't know why that. How oh, that nine came about. That was not like that. Maybe we have a bit flip somewhere. <laughs> okay, that's better. So basically, your uh, prefetch effectiveness is limited by uh, how many, uh, how much you can run ahead, right? How far ahead you can prefetch. This is called prefetch distance, as we will see. How far ahead you can prefetch is limited by the memory latency. 
because you have this L2 cache miss. When it returns back, you're going to flush the pipeline, go back, and re-execute. Now, the problem is you're limited. What if, 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 what if you execute a little bit more in the run ahead mode? Maybe you discover another cache miss, right? So there's a big trade-off you're making over there. And that's actually very interesting also. Uh, I've looked at it personally a lot to figure out what's the best way of uh, when to exit from run ahead mode. But we're not going to go into detail. So this is implemented in IBM Power 6 and Sunrock. We're going to talk about that briefly, uh, and maybe other processors also. But Power 6 is a really interesting implementation, actually. Uh, it was a simultaneous multi-threaded machine. So they, didn't do run so they, they wanted to not pay the penalty of flushing the pipeline. So what they did was, uh, whenever they got a long latency cache miss, they stopped this thread over here, and they, ch they copied the uh, context to another thread context, and they did run ahead on the other thread context. Meaning you could, uh, you could restart this thread when this thread, uh, wh when actually the long latency cache miss comes back. And this other thread that you're executing, that you spawned, that you copied from here, can keep doing run ahead for a long time. So it actually gets rid of some of the issues over here. And Sun actually had a very different implementation, which we're not going to talk about. But the basic idea is very, very similar. OK, let's take a look at performance results. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a longer break. Even I'm going to keep you a little bit longer before we take the break. Uh, we're going to keep going in the run-ahead mode for a while. <laughs> so let's take a look at uh, some of the results over here. Basically, uh, these are the intensive workloads uh, that I discussed. These were actually the workloads Intel was designing to use their, uh, desi uh, for their processors, for their single core processors at the time. Uh, and this is the average, and these are a bunch of different workloads, as you can see. Uh, there's no prefetcher and no run ahead. That's where you get. If you just use a prefetcher, that's the baseline, you get actually significant performance boost. So this shows you how effective prefetching is across all workloads, right? Almost. And if you actually just do run ahead without prefetching, it turns out it's better in this case, at least. It's not always better. As you can see here, prefetcher is much better because the uh, access patterns are much more predictable over here. And if you do a prefetcher plus run ahead, you get 22%. So the baseline is really the blue bar over here, which is not bad, actually. It's hard to improve single thread performance. And you can read the paper. So how does the stack compare to large instruction windows? So the baseline is 128 entry instruction window. If you add run ahead on top of it, this is what you get. And this is actually almost within 1%, I think, of the 384 entry instruction window. So it gets you the benefit of 3x uh, the instruction window. Uh, size, and sometimes actually more. Uh, sometimes, because, and we will discuss the trade-offs between Redhead versus the large window, uh, I guess, right now. So uh, if you have Redhead, you don't have a large window, clearly. You have a small instruction window, but you're reusing the small instruction window to do speculative prefetching, right? And all of the results that you produce during this Redhead mode, they're useless. <laughs> Basically, the only thing that uh, helps you is the prefetches that you bring in. So you do all of this work, but you don't save the results. Whereas if you have a real large window, you save the results, right? You actually don't do this pre-execution. So a big benefit of the real large window is you don't flush the pipeline at the end because of this run-ahead mode. So if you actually have, uh, so there are benefits from a large window that's not just for L2 misses, right? If you have this long floating point dependency chains, for example, actually a large window is much more beneficial, as you can see over here. It turns out this is actually a lot of floating point operations. You can see this floating point suite also. And they tend to have very long dependency chains from, uh, with, with long latency floating point instructions. So if you keep in increasing the size of the window, these workloads benefit a lot from a large window. And that, that's actually a lar very large benefit compared to run ahead. Whereas if you look over here, these workloads don't have other uh, long latency instructions than cache misses. So run ahead, even though these look small, the baseline is very small also. That's why this is actually a large uh, increase over here. Uh, but it turns out here, uh, a small window with run ahead is better than even a 1024 entry window. You don't see it over here, but it's in the paper. Uh, which means that you could actually run a lot more ahead and get, it, get the benefits, prefetching benefits of a large window. So basically, uh, 
run ahead is good at getting the prefetching benefits of a large window, but a large window gets much more than the prefetching benefits. Right? And we've discussed that a large window can tolerate floating point operation latencies better. And clearly, a large window leads to less wasted execution. OK, what about in order versus out of order? As I said, in order, it doesn't have any latency tolerance. Uh, so this is the in order baseline across the same workloads with some assumptions. If you do in order plus run ahead, you get about 40% performance improvement. But this is actually interesting because there's a huge difference between out of order without run ahead and in order plus run ahead. Right? This can be optimized further, in my opinion. Uh, but out of order and in order also has a huge difference over here. So out of order execution actually buys you a lot of performance compared to an in-order processor. That's why all of the processors today are out-of-order processors, high-perform single-thread processors. OK, I'll, I'll finish with this slide, I think. Well, maybe, uh, OK, yeah, this slide. <laughs> so as I said, this was implemented on SunRock. And SunRock was an in-order processor, actually. They had a lot of other stuff also. They tried to actually, uh, they tried to make run-ahead mode not purely speculative. Uh, they actually recycled some of the results that were generated in runhead mode also. And they eventually called it simultaneous, spe uh, simultaneous speculative threading, SST. Uh, but they called it scout. The, the pure runahead mode, they called it scout execution, which I like, actually. It's a nice name. You're basically scouting ahead and getting all these cache misses internally, right? priming your caches. But I like this picture that they uh, drew in a talk. There are papers on this also. But this is your L2 cache size on their processor. Normalized instructions per cycle performance normalized to 256 kilobytes over here. Uh, run ahead. So run ahead buys you about 40% performance, which I kind of like because it's similar to the results that I generated <laughs> in, in my machine. Uh, but basically, al almost consistently 40% performance and maybe higher somewhere over here. But they also made the trade-off in their design. They wanted to simplify their design. This is actually, uh, uh, this is not Niagara 2, Niagara 3. Maybe this is Niagara 4. So they figured out that single thread performance is very important. So they tried to improve single thread performance compared to the Niagara. And run ahead was one of the mechanisms that they added. But they didn't want to make things overly complex. So they wanted to get rid of caches in the system and add more cores. Uh, so as you can see over here, run ahead with a one megabyte cache over here is equivalent to no run ahead with eight megabyte cache on their workloads, of course. So they say it buys them seven megabytes, which they can use for other purposes. And here, at this point, run ahead with, I don't know, whatever over here is, eight megabyte cache is equivalent to run ahead, yeah, whatever. Basically, it buys you 12 megabytes over there uh, if, you're, if you're in this part of the curve. So you can save cache space. You can trade off cache space uh, with run ahead, and you can use that cache space for more threads, for example, if you benefit from that parallelism. So this is actually an interesting trade-off. If you get better single thread performance, you can, uh, you can, in a more efficient way than a large cache, which Renet provides, then you can use that real estate for something else. OK, so generalizing the idea, I'll leave you with that one. Uh, maybe there are other ways you can actually take advantage of this. SunRock is interesting in that sense, because it didn't only implement Renet. Run ahead infrastructure. That, the infrastructure that I just described to you is useful for other purposes also. For example, speculating on a lock. So whenever you get, a, get to a lock, if that lock is not contended, you could keep speculating. And SunRock implemented something, uh, well, it had transactional memory also, but it had something called speculative lock elision. And the idea is, whenever you get to that lock, you keep speculating. You, you speculate that you're going to take the lock, and you enter the critical section, and you keep executing instructions in a very similar manner that I just described. And at the end of that, you verify whether your execution was correct, whether you actually would really get the lock. If it's true, then everything you've done is good, and you've got all the prefetches into the cache. right? OK, we're not going to go into that, but that same infrastructure can be used uh, for different long latency operations as well. If you're interested, you can read the rock papers, and I'd be happy to point you to them. But if, you, if I keep going on this, we're not going to take a break. So this is a good place to stop. <laughs> Let's take a break, and I'll give you a longer break. And you can, one of these papers will be assigned as a reading. So let's take a 11-minute break. Is that good?
Okay, let's get started. So this is going to be one of your fun readings, hopefully. Although if I wrote this paper today, I would have written it better. <laughs> okay, uh, let's talk about some of these enhancements. So clearly we had some disadvantages uh, to something like this. And if you really want something to uh, get into real world, you really want to make sure those disadvantages are eliminated as much as possible. And we're going to talk about some, uh, some things uh, to eliminate those disadvantages. And this is, in one slide, a summary of the limitations of the baseline runhead mechanism that we've discussed, right? So one is energy and efficiency, actually. So when we first proposed the idea, actually, this was, we knew about this problem, and a lot of people actually criticized it that, the same way also. The problem is you can have a large number of instructions that are speculatively executed, and you don't get any benefit from it, right? So you really want to solve that problem. And the second limitation is ineffectiveness for pointer-intensive applications, right? If you have a lot of dependent cache misses, this is not effective, so you cannot parallelize them. And the last one is actually a problem with all large instruction window machines, branch mispredictions, right? You cannot recover from a mispredicted long-latency misdependent branch. And run is actually especially bad, potentially, because with a small window, you stop at some point, but with a large window, or run ahead, so you keep executing. And if you're not getting benefit on top of that, that energy and efficiency problem multiplies. Right? So we're going to look at uh, different ways of fixing the problem. The last one we're not going to fully fix, but we're going to try to understand, because this really goes into designing a better branch predictor. Although I will talk about an another idea for at least limiting the uh, downsides. So let's look at the efficiency problem. These are results uh, from another paper that you have. But basically, uh, this is the percentage increase in performance or instructions per cycle with run ahead. It's not the same thing as performance. But in this case, I assume it's the same thing as performance because there's nothing in run ahead that would change the processor frequency. If you actually change the processor frequency when you're implementing run ahead, then you're doing something wrong. Uh, but basically, uh, increase in performance, IPC, it's about 22%. Percent increase in executed instructions is about 27%. So you're paying a cost. And this cost, you may say, it's not a bad deal, actually. But averages can be misleading. So if you look at this workload, for example, you're gaining less than 10% performance improvement, but executing more, almost 60% additional instructions. And this one, you're gaining no performance and executing almost 50% more instructions. So a bad deal, right? You're wasting battery life. And this one is actually, even though you're gaining a lot of performance, you're doubling your performance almost, but you're also almost more than tripling your instructions that are executed. So this is not good. Uh, although if you do the calculation, some of these trade-offs are not bad. Uh, so for example, in this case, you're increasing performance by 100%, doubling the performance, and increasing the number of instructions that are executed by 80%. Not bad, actually, but can we do better? So what are the causes of inefficiency? Uh, there may be other causes also, but there are three general causes. One is, it turns out, there are some run ahead periods where you enter run ahead and exit it very quickly. So you don't even get to go ahead further. There are some run ahead periods that are overlapping with the previous ones, and there are some useless, like purely useless run ahead periods because you don't have this memory level parallelism. Let's take a look at each of these very quickly. Well, I'm not going to go into the mechanisms of fixing them, but if, once you understand the problem, fixing it is actually relatively easy. Uh, and you can actually develop mechanisms to fix it. But basically, short run ahead periods, these are caused by, due to, usually caused by an already in-flight L2 miss, generated by the prefetcher, the wrong path, or a previous run ahead period. Basically, you get into this, uh, you get this L2 cache miss, it blocks your instruction window, you go into run ahead mode, soon after, the miss returns back, uh, well, well, this is, one, okay, let's, let me start that again, because I'm going to give you one example of an L2 cache miss that's generated by a previous run ahead period. So the first run ahead mode, you get into the run ahead mode, you pre-execute, you f discover another cache miss, L2 miss, that's nice. And then you exit run ahead mode when the first miss comes back, you flush the pipeline. The second miss is still continuing, but you start, uh, restart the pipeline, and you uh, start with load one. While the second miss is continuing, you get to this load two miss in normal mode, because you're executing this again. And this load two miss, it's not done yet, so you enter run ahead mode. But it's done very soon after, 
so you exit run ahead mode again. And then you compute. So this run ahead mode is not good because it's very short. Right? You cannot discover much. So this is one example of a previous run ahead prefetch causing you a short run ahead period. You could imagine this could happen because of something else, wrong path, the prefetcher, dot, 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 right? So short periods are actually very unlikely to generate useful L2 misses, and they have high overhead because this flush penalty at the run ahead exit, right? So run ahead doesn't come at, uh, with zero cost. It comes with this flush penalty. You, ha you had this full pipeline, you're flushing it. Okay, so how do you fix this problem? It's actually relatively easy. You try to guess how long you will stay in run ahead mode. And it's not that bad. So if the miss is not in flight, and if it's an L2 miss, it's likely that you're going to stay for a long time in run ahead mode. OK, so the second cause is because of dependent uh, cache misses. So two run ahead periods execute almost the same instructions, overlapping periods. You get into this run ahead mode. While you're executing, this load you fetch and it turns out this is dependent on this load, so you cannot compute the address of this load, right? Because the address depends on the data that you're supposed to load, but you don't have the data for this load. As a result, you mark it invalid, you keep it and run ahead. And at the end, you go back, uh, you start with load one, it hits. Now, when you execute load two in normal mode, you can calculate its address because it was dependent on this load one, which was fetched now. And you run into, you go into run ahead mode because it turns out this is also a cache miss. Now, if you look at the instructions that are executed in both nodes, the instructions that are executed here overlap with the instructions that are executed over here. Now, even though they're the same instructions, assuming the branch predictor gets you the same way, uh, this may be beneficial because now you have a data value, right? This load two's value is available. Well, sorry, load one's value is available, and any other values that are generated over here are available, uh, but they, based on that load one, perhaps. So you may actually do some more useful stuff over here than you could over here. And also, there's some benefit at the end. Like you could get to a point where you have you execute something that you didn't execute over here. But it turns out these are very inefficient still. The second period is still inefficient because you're re-executing. That instruction. So think about you're traversing a linked list. The first node gets a cache miss. You cannot compute the address of the next node. The next node gets a cache miss. You cannot compute the address of the next node. So you keep going into run ahead while you traverse the linked list, and you waste a lot of energy without getting a lot of performance. That was the problem with parser workload. It's really parsing a lot of strings, and it's getting all these cache misses uh, because it has a linked data structure. OK. So how do you eliminate this? Again, once you know the problem, it's simple, right? You could guess whether you're going to be in an overlapping run ahead period. OK, so the otherwise useless run ahead periods are everything else almost that's useless, periods that do not result in prefetches for normal modes. So you go into run ahead, and you don't have prefetches, or you don't have uh, L2 cache misses, and you exit run ahead. Basically, you paid, you flushed your pipeline for no reason. I like thinking of it that way. So these exist due to lack of memory level parallelism or the fact that your run ahead period is short to discover the next miss. Uh, but basically, you would like to get rid of them. And the mechanism is you can predict if a period will generate useful L2 misses. You could do that based on past behavior of a load instruction, it turns out. Uh, and you can estimate a period uh, to be useful if it generates an L2 miss that cannot be captured by the instruction window. So this is also important, right? You're running ahead. You, the L2 cache miss that you get to shouldn't be uh, capturable by your instruction window, 128 entry instruction window. It should be out of that somewhere. You can actually predict, uh, you can actually train your predictors based on the system. So you can actually come up with a very simple predictor that does this prediction reasonably well. And if you do all of that, uh, you can reduce the number of instructions or extra instructions executed by a lot, as you can see from 27% to 6% over here. And these really bad cases become better. For example, this workload, we had increased the uh, in instructions to 60%. Now it's less than 10%. Here, we had increased to almost 50%. Now it's almost 2%, let's say. And here, where we were gaining a lot, we reduced the instructions by a lot, as you can see. 
So you can make things much more efficient, as you can see. Well, and also in, inst also in cases where we were gaining a lot, these were, this was one case where we gained a lot of performance, we can gain similar amount of performance by executing much less instructions. So this is the instructions executed, and this is the performance impact. If you do the baseline on it, you get about 22%. If you do all of the techniques, you get about 22%. Right? So without affecting performance, you improve the energy efficiency. And sometimes, it turns out, actually, you improve the performance as well. Because it turns out, uh, wrong pass can be not good for performance, right? It may cause contention in the caches. Or uh, the flushes cost you, right? There are all these kind of issues. Uh, not always, as you can see, right? Usually, performance gets reduced. But in some cases, performance also improves. OK. So you can read that paper also, but I'm not going to assign that, I think. OK. Any questions? So I just want to give you the story, because whenever you have a, a good idea, you really want to make it efficient for it to be really implementable. Uh, so don't stop with a good idea. <laughs> Go to the next step, and next step, and next step. So one thing I will discuss over here, I already said this, CERNED mode is purely speculative. The goal is to find and, and generate cache misses that would otherwise stall execution later on. One question that I will ask, but not answer necessarily, how do we achieve this goal most efficiently and with the highest benefit? And one idea is to find and execute only those instructions that will lead to cache misses, right? That already cannot be captured by the instruction window. So the question is, of course, how do you do this? Right? We're still executing the entire program, but we're just getting rid of the uh, runhead periods that are useless. But maybe uh, if we can somehow find those instructions that are really useful, we only execute those instructions. Or maybe we start a thread that gets to those instructions. How do we do that? I don't know yet. But we'll discuss some ideas, pre-execution based, pre-fetching uh, later on. But that, increase, that would increase the complexity also. So one other idea over here is, for, for example, in run-ahead mode, usually there is no reason to execute a floating point instruction. So you can turn off your floating point unit in run-ahead mode. Because floating point instructions usually are not used to generate addresses. And run-ahead mode's benefit comes from cache misses. And if you don't, you're not generating addresses, don't do those complicated floating point operations, right? That's very simple, of course. Now, there's, even that's a trade-off, because what might happen is, in a floating point program, you may compare, you may branch on a floating point value. Right? And that determines which path you take. So if you have a branch that's mispredicted, that's dependent on some floating point calculation, if you turned off your floating point unit, now you can never recover from that branch misprediction. And you may actually be on the wrong path and maybe not fetching uh, the best things uh, into your machine. So even that is a trade-off. OK, so we've tackled the first problem. The second problem is actually related to energy and efficiency, but it's also important in terms of performance. Let's take a look at that one. So assume that we have a load that's dependent on load one. We've seen this before. This was the cause of overlapping periods. You, the load two, when you get to it during run-ahead mode, you cannot do anything about it. You cannot even generate its address because the address is dependent on data that's not anywhere in the processor. So you mark it invalid and keep on with the run-ahead mode. And at the end, you exit, you restart the machine, and then when you execute this load in normal mode, now you can compute its address because the data value that it's dependent on is generated, and it calls entry into run-ahead mode because it's a cache miss. Now, this is a fundamental problem with run-ahead execution because it cannot parallelize dependence. This is a fundamental problem with out-of-order execution also. Out-of-order execution cannot parallelize dependent instructions as well. But this leads to wasted opportunity to improve performance because if you actually could parallelize this, you could actually start that miss early. And it also wastes energy that uses pre-execution over here and maybe here also. And uh, based on ideal studies on some workloads, it turns out performance would improve by 25% if you ideally knew this instruction's address. And of course, this 25% is dependent on what workloads you examine. Some workloads actually benefit a lot more than 25%. So what's the idea? Basically, how do you actually fix this problem? This is actually a very tough problem in general. Uh, linked data structures are much tougher than regular not linked data structures, right? If your data address computation is dependent on some data, then you have a problem. 
So one idea is to enable the parallelization of dependent L2 caches in Renate mode with a low-cost mechanism by predicting the values of L2 misaddress or pointer loads. So clearly, this one is a pointer load. It's loading a data value that's going to be used as an address or base address for some other instruction over here. So uh, the, an address load, I'll define it as a load, uh, it load, uh, a load that loads an address into its destination register, which is later used to calculate the address of another load. As opposed to a data load, it loads a value that's never going to be used for address computation. Right? So we'd like to predict these things. Data loads, maybe there's a good reason to predict them also for branch mispredictions, right? We're not going to talk, talk about that, but we're going to talk about this uh, dependent cache misses. Okay. So let's take a look at that. So before, this is what we had. Now, if in Renate mode, we had this nice mechanism that predicts the value of this address load, let's assume it gets it approximately correct, or correct, let's say. Uh, and this load, too, can compute its address now. It can generate its miss. It can parallelize that miss. And when you exit Renate mode, the miss is done. And both of the, the, the second load hits, you save a lot of cycles again. And you save a lot of instructions that are uselessly executed as well. OK, so how do you actually do this prediction? Well, uh, yeah, save speculative instructions. So you could actually imagine. This is actually value prediction, which we didn't talk a lot uh, in detail about. Uh, value prediction has been proposed. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the first value prediction papers uh, that, were, uh, that, uh, that was published at Micro in 1996 uh, received the Test of Time Award this year uh, in, in the microconference. Uh, but uh, it's a more general idea of value prediction itself, right? For example, you could say, I'm going to predict this, the value of this load to be zero. That's called zero value prediction. In that case, this, it wouldn't help you here, right? <laughs> because this load computes a non-zero address clearly. You're not going to fetch null, uh, null pointers. Uh, you, and also, you could come up with other mechanisms. You predict the address that is the same as the previous address that this load generated. You could have a table that records those, right? Now, if the load always generates the same address, that may be OK. But if it doesn't generate the same address, if it's a linked data traversal, whenever you're actually doing a linked list traversal, the same load actually visits many different nodes. So it always generates a different address, right? So that won't work also. So how do you actually do this prediction? Well, the idea in this work is uh, simple. We're going to define the address value delta of a load instruction as this, AVD, uh, effective address of the load minus the data value of the load. And when you execute the load, you know both, right? You know the effective address, you know the data value. And it turns out, for some loads, this AVD value is stable. I can guess why. Actually, once you, figure, once you know why it's uh, nice. Uh, and I'm going to show you why <laughs> in a little bit. Nothing is magic. <laughs> so an AVD predictor keeps track of these AVDs of address loads. So AVD stable means uh, you execute the load, effective address minus data value is, let's say, 10. Uh, the next time you execute the load, it has a different effective address, but the data value is still 10. Uh, the, 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 uh, the AVD is still 10. The next time you execute it, it has a different effective address, but AVD is still 10. Now, this could happen. And if you, if you know that this is the case, you can keep track of the AVDs of the address loads. And when a load in a, is an L2 miss in run mode, you consult this predictor. And if the predictor returns a stable or confident, we talked about confidence in case of branch pr prediction, but the same thing applies to value prediction also. If it's a confident value prediction, if it's a stable AVD, you predict the value of the load. And you predict the value very simply. Predicted value is equal to effective address minus the predicted AVD. Now, you know the effective address. If you go back to this, you know the effective address of this one. You figured out that it's a cache miss. You just don't know the value. But if you know the AVD, you subtract the AVD from the effective address, and you get the predicted value. Sounds like magic, right? <laughs> That's not magic, because there is a lot of regularity in the way data structures are allocated in memory and traversed. We'll take a look at both of them. Uh, it turns out when actually uh, I discovered this, it was discovered the way exactly I presented over here. 
when I looked at how do I predict these loads, it turned out there was stability in these effective address data value differences. So I didn't come up with, uh, f uh, to it knowing or thinking uh, that there was regularity. It was really more bottom-up. But let's take a look at that, why, why this makes sense. So there are two types of loads that can have stable AVDs. Uh, I'm going to define some things. Traversal address loads. These produce addresses consumed by other address loads. So the linkless traversal load, for example, is a very good example. The same load produces an address of the next node. Again, then you actually use that address to produce the address of the next node, and then you use that address to produce the address of the next node. There's also a leaf address load. These produce the addresses consumed by data loads. And we'll take a look at that. Let's look at the traversal address load. Let's look at a regularly allocated linked list. You have a nice memory allocator, uh, or you do the allocation at the same time. You allocate first node at A, uh, memory address A. The next node address is address A plus K. The next node address is address A plus 2K. The next node address is A plus 3K, dot, dot, dot. And if you look at the traversal address load, it basically loads the pointer to the next node. That's what you do, essentially, when you do a linked list traversal. Right? And let's take a look at the AVD of this load when this load executes. And you remember, AVD is the effective address minus the data value. When this load visits the first node, effective address is A. And the data value is the address of the next node, which is A plus K. So your AVD in this case is minus K. When it visits the next node in the next iteration, the effective address is A plus K. The data value is the address of the next node, A plus 2K, and the AVD is minus K. When it visits the next node in the next iteration, its effective address is the address of the node, A plus 2K. Its data value is the address of the next node, A plus 3K, and the AVD is, as you can see, minus K. So this is broken only if this is not regular, clearly. But if it's regular, you can predict the address value deltas, right? Now, this is not the only way of predicting it, but this is a very cheap way of predicting it. Another way of predicting it is realizing that the data value has a stride. Right? If you look at the data values, those are regular also. The first data value is A plus K. The next one is A plus 2K. So the delta between the data values is always constant. So there's another way of predicting this particular type of load, actually. But it turns out it's more costly to implement a stride predictor compared to this particular predictor that's really specialized for this purpose. OK. Well, I just showed that's the stride data value. So let's look at another kind of load, uh, which is not predictable by a stride predictor, actually. So let's look at parser. This is the, the workload that I discussed, right? You have a sorted dictionary in parser. You have nodes that point to strings. And strings and nodes happen to be allocated consecutively. So you have a, uh, when you form the dictionary, sort it, you allocate the string, and you allocate the node. Uh, string is allocated at address C. Node is allocated at address C plus K, and they are linked together. Another node, another string, and another node, they're allocated at address F and address F plus K, uh, and they're linked together. And you form the dictionary, and the dictionary is eventually sorted, and you get this nice tree, basically. <laughs> and you look up the dictionary for an input word, and it's a binary search, essentially, in this case. Uh, you, uh, you have a leaf address load, that loads the pointer to the string of each node. So you visit, uh, no, you traverse the tree, but whenever you visit a node, you need to look up the string, right, to compare to the string that, that is input to you. So let's take a look at that uh, instruction. Those, this is the instruction. You basically, whenever you visit a node, uh, you need to load the string, and you need to check whether it matches the input string. Let's look at the AVD of this particular load instruction, because it executes on whatever you visit. So the effective address, whenever you visit the first node, the effective address is A plus K, the address of the node. The data value is the address of the string, which is A, and AVD is K. Now let's assume that you didn't get a match. So the, the loop over here takes you to the right side of the tree. The effective address of the node that you're visiting now is C plus K. That's the address of the node, which is the effective address of this particular instruction. The data value is the address of the string. And the AVD is, as you can see, k again. And again, you didn't match, so your string happened to be on the left side of the tree. And then you visit this node. Effective address is f plus k. Data value is f. And you get an AVD that's constant. 
And you can see that this is stable, so you can predict it and do whatever you need with it. Now, the data value doesn't have stride here, so you cannot predict this with a striding predictor. Right? Clearly, there are other issues over here. It's like, can you predict the addresses that uh, going from A plus K to C plus K? Now, that's hard, right? We're going to see later prefetching mechanisms that try to do that. But this is exactly, this is one of the other hard problems in computing systems. How do you actually uh, improve latency tolerance in the presence of these hard-to-predict addresses? Here, we made something predictable that was not predictable with uh, known methods. Right? There is no stride over here. So that's a leaf address load. Make sense? OK. OK, so uh, the next question is, now that we know why stable ABDs might, ex might exist, uh, you can actually write software to maximize the stability of the ABDs. Some people have proposed, for example, the, the nice linked list that I showed you. If you actually keep changing the linked list, uh, when it comes to a stable state, if you have a garbage collector, for example, uh, these things are employed in some garbage collectors of the world, like Common Language Runtime in Microsoft uh, or Hotspot in Java. Uh, what they do is, during the time of garbage collection, they try to relay out the linked list such that you get a nice layout between the nodes. So they, they basically, if, if the thing is stable, they move the linked list, so let me go back over here, maybe I explain it uh, with this one. It's harder with trees, of course. So assume that this is not nice like this, you have A, B, C, D, E, F, that's totally all over the memory place, the memory. Uh, if you have a garbage collector that runs once in a while, what it can do is, it can take the linked list that is all over the place, and it can move it such that it's sequential, in the address space, such that when you traverse it the next time, you get very nice spatial locality. So if you're a garbage collected language, that's one of the benefits of garbage collection. While you're doing garbage collection, you can do this kind of memory layout optimizations. And Trishul Chilimbi has a nice paper on that, which we should point in the, I don't remember right now, it's in PLDI 2002, I think. Uh, okay, so basically there are software mechanisms that you can use to improve uh, the spatial locality, those things actually help the predictability of these values, or AVDs in this case. Okay, so the next question is, how do you identify address loads in hardware? So we want to do this purely in hardware, right? And we want to do this only for address loads, because if a load is loading some value and that you're not using it for address calculation, you don't want to predict them, because they're not going to buy you much benefit. But if you actually start predicting them, you, you need to record them in your table, and your table becomes large. Right? So you really want to do this prediction for the loads where you will get the maximum benefits, which is really the address loads. So the insight over here is borrowed from another paper that I'm going to discuss in prefetching later. But basically, if the AVD is too large, the value that's loaded is likely not an address. Because it turns out addresses are allocated from a particular region of memory, uh, and they're close to each other. If your AVD is, I don't know, the entire span of the memory, for example, then what you're loading is likely not an address. As you can see over here, the address here is C plus K, C, and that K is usually small. Similarly, in the linked list allocation, that K that we saw, uh, saw was small. So basically, you just, whenever you calculate an AVD, you compare it to a max AVD and uh, in both sides also, because it's a, you compare the magnitude of the AVD to max AVD, basically. And if AVD is small, then you say, oh, this is likely an address load. You cannot be sure, of course, uh, but this is likely an address load. So this is a simple way of guessing whether a, a load instruction is loading an address or not. Now, another alternative is punting on the software. The software knows exactly which load is loading an address load. This one is an address load, for example, right? It's a leaf address load. The other one is a traversal address load. So the software actually can have a bit saying, oh, I'm, this is an address load, but then that requires changing the software. We don't want to change the software here. So this identification mechanism eliminates many loads from consideration for prediction. So you need to, there's no need to value predict the loads that will not generate addresses and it enables the predictor to be small. So let's look at this implementable AVD predict. It's actually very small. It's a set associated prediction table. It consists of a tag, the program counter of the load, last AVD seen for the load, and a confidence counter for the recorded AVD. 
It's updated when an address load is retired in normal mode, and it's accessed when a load misses an L2 cache in run-ahead mode. And the benefit of this value prediction is recovery-free. So when value prediction, so value prediction is in general not employed in processors today. Uh, and the person um, who won the test of time award, Mikko Lipas, had a nice presentation describing why it's not employed, dot, 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 in today's process. One of the reasons is if you mispredict, you need to recover. So it affects your correctness. When you add the value predictor into the design of today's processors, you need to recover. But in this case, we're doing this value prediction in a purely speculative mode anyway. So there's no need to recover. If you mispredict, you don't care. In fact, if you mispredict, you cannot even verify in run-ahead mode, right? <laughs> because you don't have the data value to verify. OK, uh, let me show you the simple. Uh, basically, this is the update logic. You have the effective address and the data value. And you compare it to max AVD over here. If it's a valid AVD, you either update the confidence update the AVD, or store it over here. And this happens in normal mode, because in normal mode, you figure out the addresses, right? Uh, and the prediction logic is very simple also. You get the program counter of the L2 load. You check if it exists, if a confident AVD exists. If a confident AVD exists, you predict it. And the predicted value is essentially effective address minus the AVD. So it's very simple, off the critical path. It doesn't affect a lot of things. So what does it buy you? On workloads where this matters, it buys you a lot. And there are some workloads where it matters. There are a lot of workloads where it doesn't matter because they don't do this. Or they don't have regular allocation patterns. Or they don't do the linked list traversals as much. So for example, this is, this is the poster child, the health workload. It's a very interesting workload. Uh, it's, it's simulating, uh, I think, doctor uh, allocation in a health system. It's written in a terrible way. <laughs> It's written in a terrible way uh, because we can improve it, its performance this much. Uh, so it it's basically goes through a lot of linked lists without a lot of parallelism. And it's very predictable. So you could actually, somebody actually showed that if you rewrote this program in a reasonable way, uh, your performance improves by 200x or something like that. <laughs> anyway, but bad software exists. <laughs> And uh, this improves the performance of health a lot, but this does improve the performance of tree ads. So it basically goes through a tree and add stuff. This is the traveling salesman problem. This is the minimum spanning tree. So there are more reasonable performance improvements over here. It's about 10, 12% over here. It's about 50% or 40% over here, right? So basically, uh, you uh, reduce the execution time significantly and reduce the execution, execute instructions also significantly. And maybe we didn't test with the best workloads also over here. But it's a tough problem, so if you have interest, there is a lot to do in this area, uh, I think. OK. Any questions? Yes? Uh, which information? The AVD? Uh, so the compiler can provide, whether it's a pointer, uh, that's easy. But AVD goes through uh, a step uh, that's, uh, that comes uh, after the compiler, right? the memory allocator. So maybe the memory allocator can provide that information. Yeah, I guess for static data structures, you're right. That's right. For dynamically allocated data structures, no. But uh, for statically allocated data structures, I think so, yes. I haven't thought about the static case. But you're absolutely right in that case. Yeah. That would be nice, actually. <laughs> so this paper, actually, uh, I didn't describe how you can do this much better, but we've actually looked at changing the application uh, to, uh, e even in the presence of dynamic uh, memory allocation, if you change the application and change the times at which data structures are allocated, you could take advantage of the fact that the underlying memory allocator is regularly allocating things, and you could increase the occurrence of these regular AVDs. In Parser, for example, uh, in one of the workloads, uh, the, the allocation of the nodes uh, and, the, mm, and the string were done at very different times. If you, make, if you actually regularize it, you could take advantage of this. And I think a compiler can do those sort of optimizations also. They can regularize when these different data structures are allocated. Okay, so let's talk about some other ideas. Uh, as I said, one of the other issues was uh, wrong path. And I think uh, if you go, go into wrong path in run-ahead mode, uh, you have a problem. 
because you're executing on the wrong path, first of all, that may or may not be useful, right? So one of the things that uh, people have tried to do is stop uh, if you predict you're on the wrong path. And we've seen already one way of doing it. One way of doing it was if you've seen a lot of low-confidence branch predictions, if you've seen, let's say, five branch predictions that are really low confidence, you say, oh, I'm likely on the wrong path right now because I was not confident in any of the five branches that I predicted in the past, so let me stop fetching. That's one idea, right? Uh, and I think this is a really good idea, actually. Can you do better than that? Uh, and while we were exploring Runahead, we actually stumbled upon something really interesting, which I don't think is easy to exploit, but I'll give you the idea. Uh, sorry for the different things. These were the fonts I, were, I was using in the past. So I think I hope I improved a little bit. <laughs> this is from a micro in 2004 presentation. Uh, but basically, uh, so clearly, there are a bunch of instructions that are executed on the wrong path, and I'm going to quantify this later on. Uh, the key question that we asked was, is the behavior of wrong path instructions different from the behavior of correct path instructions? I think there's a lot of interesting things that could be done if you could answer this well. If this is true, you can use the difference in behavior for early misprediction detection and recovery. And this is the idea, basically. An instance of illegal or unusual behavior that's more likely to occur on the wrong path than on the correct path. We we'll call that a wrong path event. Uh, and if you get a wrong path event, with almost certain probability that you're, uh, you can predict that you're on the wrong path. So what are those illegal or unusual behaviors? Uh, why does it occur? So one, of, one example is null pointer exception. You don't normally accept, uh, you, you don't normally expect that you'll get a null pointer dereference on the correct path unless your program has a bug. But if your program has a bug, then you have a bigger problem than being on the correct path or the wrong path. But it turns out that null pointer, accept, uh, null pointer dereference occurs much, much more likely on the wrong path. Because you go into some path, your data values are not correct, you're not supposed to go into that path, so you dereference a pointer that happens to be zero. You're not supposed to do that. Now that could be an indication that you're on the wrong path. Right? Okay, so basically a wrong path instruction may be executed before the mispredicted branch is executed because the mispredicted branch may be dependent on a long latency instruction. That's exactly the problem that we've seen earlier, right? You have a long latency load, you have a branch that's dependent on it, and then everything else is independent. That could happen. And the wrong path instruction may consume a data value that's not properly initialized. Right? Uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, this is one example from one workload again, you basically go through uh, this array, uh, and you ba uh, this is an array of pointers, essentially. And you dereference this pointer. That's, uh, this is an array of pointers to structs, as you can see. Uh, and this is the array that we're going to look at. Let's look at each iteration of the loop. First iteration, i is 0, and you load a nice pointer. Uh, loop branch is correctly predicted, so you go into the next iteration, speculatively. Uh, loop branch is correctly predicted, so you dereference the pointer. And then loop branches, loop exit branch is mispredicted, so you keep going. You go into the next iteration, you're on the wrong path now, and you dereference a pointer that you're not supposed to dereference because you're not supposed to go out of the boundary of this array. You're not supposed to mispredict that branch, right? Well, you did mispredict. So if this, you're executing on the wrong path, and you get a null pointer dereference because it turns out this is zero, right? Similarly, you can get an access protection exception, right? You're not going to report that because you're on the wrong path, but you know you can, you, can, you can get the clue that you're on the wrong path, right? Because normally you're not supposed to get an access protection exception. If you get that, there's a bigger problem again. Right? So similar events are wrong path events. So it could happen because of null pointer dereference, right to a read-only page, for example, unaligned accesses. This is illegal in some ISAs. Uh, a bunch of different protection exceptions, for example. And also softer events. For example, you may actually get many, many TLB misses on the wrong path. It turns out this is true. You get many, many TLB misses on the wrong path. So a lot of memory-related events that normally doesn't, uh, don't occur on the correct path occur on the wrong path. Uh, and also, this, uh, it could happen due to control flow events. So you get a lot of mispredictions, for example. This is just one example. You don't need to read all of that, but you can on your spare time. Basically, if, you get, if you're getting a lot of mispredictions at the same time, you might think that, oh, this is a hint that I'm on the wrong path. That may not be always true, but it turns out this is a good indicator. If you underflow the return address stack, if you're, or overflow the return address stack, it turns out this is uh, on the wrong path, this is more common. 
because people usually program nicely. Uh, remember, we discussed overflowing the return address stack. Actually, overflow is more common than underflow uh, because overflow means you you have a lot of levels of nesting in your call stack, right? You you keep calling, but underflow is hard because you 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 really need to have more returns than calls in that case. It turns out it happens a lot on their own path. Or unaligned instruction fetch address. That's also illegal in some ISAs. And also you, get, you may get some arithmetic exceptions, divide by zero, for example, because of uninitialized values. And these all could be good indicator, indicators of wrong path. Now, there are multiple questions after that. How do you exploit it? I'm not going to cover that. I'm going to leave you, if you're interested, you can read the paper. And there's a lot more research that could be done in this area, I think. How, uh, how often do wrong path events occur? And when do they occur when you're on the wrong path? So uh, you may be on the wrong path, let's say, for 500 cycles. If this event occurs 400, on the 499th cycle, you're going to recover in the next cycle anyway. So it's kind of useless if this event occurs at that time, right? So it's good to answer these questions. But if you're interested, you can take a look at the paper. And that's the paper. OK. So why is this important? But before I go into why it's this important, uh, we should probably take a break. Any question, any burning question on this before we move on? Is this interesting? I, th I find this really fascinating, actually. If you come up with a really good way of doing this, I think that could change the way we think about wrong path versus correct path. You may actually recover and then go into the correct path and do the right thing, right? <laughs> Okay, let's take, a, uh, take an eight-minute break. Turn on the lights, okay. Well, maybe we could even open that, actually. Yeah, we will, we will turn on the lights. Let's start the break, though. Maybe you can open that. That's probably better. Is the lighting better now? Okay, it doesn't put you to sleep. That's good. OK, so we've talked about wrong path. Uh, let's also talk about why is this important. This is something that, as I said, fascinated me uh, and us uh, while we were working on it. Uh, the reason it's important, as we've discussed before, is a modern processor actually spends significant amount of time fetching, executing instructions on the wrong path. And this is some data from one of the papers. Uh, if you, let's look at this a little bit uh, quickly. The first one is the percentage of cycles that are on the wrong path over total number of cycles. Averaged across all of the workloads, it's close to 50%, as you can see. Fetch, percentage of fetched wrong path instructions over all fetched instructions, again, it's over 50% actually over here. Percentage of executed wrong path instructions over all executed instructions, it's about not bad, so it's 15%. But those 15% can be harmful. So it shows you that actually the front end of the machine is very powerful, whereas the back end is slower. Things are going slowly in the back end. As a result, there's a huge discrepancy between the fetch and uh, back end. And about half, uh, maybe not half, maybe one third of the instructions are uh, wrong path memory instructions right? that are executed. Uh, maybe 5%, I don't know, 6% of the instructions. So basically, a processor spends a lot of its time on the wrong path, with, even with a good branch predictor, right? Uh, and a run-ahead processor is actually much more so. Uh, this, these numbers over here don't change that much, maybe, the fetch percentage of uh, time spent on the wrong path in the fetch engine. And there may be averaging issues over here. But the per percentage of instructions that are executed on the wrong path definitely increases with run-ahead execution. So as you can see, for example, with MCF was executing about 25% instructions on the wrong path here in a normal processor, but in a run-ahead processor, it's executing more than half of the instructions on the wrong path. Right. Doesn't sound good, right? So the key question is, uh, is it useful or not? So I, I wanted to cover this because there are multiple issues here. First of all, is it important to model this or not? That was one of the questions we asked uh, at that time. Second of all, can you do something about it? Right. I'm not going to answer the can you do something about it right now, but let's talk about is it important to model it, and what is the effect? Can we understand the effects? Right. Basically, we wanted to measure the error in simulation if wrong path memory references are not modeled. And I think I find this interesting. 
So there are many questions that are answered in the paper. I'm not going to go over all of them, but how important is it to correctly model? Do they affect performance positively or negatively? What kind of code structures lead to positive effects and negative effects? Negative effects are not there because they're harder to analyze, actually. Uh, and how do the things change with a run ahead processor? Let's take a look at the first one. It turns out wrong path is often useful for performance. Uh, I say performance, not energy, right? <laughs> We can be careful there. But basically, these are results uh, with single-threaded workload, single core. Uh, and this is the percentage of error that you get in the IPC if you do not model the wrong path. So your IPC is lower by, on average, I don't know, 3% over here if you do not model the wrong path in a single-core processor. So, which means that uh, you underestimate the performance if you do not model the wrong path. Uh, that, that's not always true. As you can see, there are some workloads over here. Uh, your IPC is higher if you model the wrong path. Your, mod, uh, your estimated IPC, of course, right? That's not the real IPC. We're <coughs> playing with our simulator. So it turns out for these workloads, actually, wrong path is not useful because the, it pollutes the caches. It causes issues in the memory. But usually, it's cache pollution that it causes. It kicks out something useful from the cache. But as you can see over here, most of the time, in fact, in this workload, uh, you get 10% performance benefits if you model the wrong path, <laughs> meaning that wrong path is useful by 10%, right, performance. And MCF is like that also. The, the reason is why. Can you guys guess why? I think you can. <laughs> okay, let's, before you guess why, let's take a look at that. So with run ahead, uh, this is the performance improvement that you get if you correctly model the wrong path references. In this case, it's about 30%. with a different set of workloads. If you don't model them, you get about 17%. So there's a huge gap. A lot of the benefits are actually coming from the wrong path. So the M MCF, for example, which was spending 55% of its instructions on the wrong path, executing 55% of its instructions on the wrong path. If you don't model the wrong path, your benefits go down to... 25%, 30% from 120%. So clearly, wrong path is providing a lot of benefits, especially in run ahead mode. So why is this happening? So you examine the workload, MCF is one example. So wrong path is not always bad because you converge and you go back to a control independent point even if you're on the wrong path. Let's take a look at an example over here. This is, so MCF is an interesting program also. This is, it does vehicle scheduling. Essentially, if you're the bus authority, for example, or the tram authority here, how do you schedule those buses uh, across uh, the world, let's say? Um, I'm not going to go into the detail of how it does it, but basically it has this huge for loop. And there is this if uh, that you have over here. And it turns out this is a frequently mispredicted branch because it's dependent on a data value that's relatively random. Now, if you mispredict this branch, you go into this function call. Maybe you execute some useless stuff. But you'll eventually go back to the next iteration of the loop. Right? And the next iteration of the loop is independent of the branch, it turns out. So even if you're on the wrong path, you converge. You're actually on the correct path, except you follow the bad path to get to the correct path. Right? So maybe some of your data values are not correct because of this. Maybe you don't care because maybe you, you may be actually control independent as well as data independent in the next iteration, right? If that's the case, then you're actually doing useful work on the wrong path. And uh, there are many cases where this happens. Loop iterations are independent, con control independent of each other. So you get to that point. And if your data values are still reasonably correct to get, generate the prefetches, that's good. Or in an out of order execution machine, if data values, again, in an out of order execution machine, also the benefit comes from prefetching, right? You're on the wrong path, you execute in the wrong path, you prefetch in the later loop iterations, uh, and you actually prefetch correct values, and then you flush the pipeline in the end. But you've also already prefetched useful stuff that you're going to execute in the future. So that's one example over here. Now, this may help give you ideas of how you can exploit this even more. Because it turns out this control independence is something interesting. You may be on the wrong path for a really short time, 
but you flush the pipeline. Remember, we discussed predicate execution that tries to get rid of this problem, right? If you actually predicate these instructions, you actually get rid of that flush. But then there may be a lot of stuff over here that are predicated. OK, so another example over here, which is really interesting, I find. Basically, here, these two loops actually prefetch for each other. If you mispredict this loop, uh, you're actually prefetching for the other one, it turns out. Anyway, you can read the paper for that. That's, that's a little bit uh, of a lower, uh, less common case. Well, let's look at another case. Uh, this is another case. Uh, you have a hammock branch. Hammock branch is if-then-else or if-else branch. Uh, and again, this is from MCF because it sees most of the benefits from wrong path. Uh, you have this branch that's mispredicted. You look at the node orientation. If it's up, you do something. If it's down, you do something. Except you operate on the same data. So if you're on the wrong path, you, do, you prefetch the cache block that you're going to need on the correct path anyway, regardless of which path you take over here. So you at least get the prefetching benefit. And also, there's a control flow of independence uh, point over here. You get other benefits as well. Okay. So there is a program structure that lets you benefit from the wrong path. And people have tried to uh, exploit things like, oh, can we recover the work that we've done on the wrong path? Because we spend a lot of time on the wrong path. Can we actually try to recover it? Uh, I don't know what they called that. I don't remember it now. Wrong path recycling or something like that. Uh, they showed benefits. Uh, it leads to some expensive structures in, in the machine. So that's why it's not implemented in existing processors. If you come up with a way of implementing it simpler, maybe there is a way. So there's the idea of reuse that could benefit uh, this. For example, uh, well, reuse is maybe a little bit harder. But for example, if you execute an instruction over here, which is the same as the instruction over here, and on the wrong path you executed it, you computed the data value, Inputs didn't change. When you see that instruction on the correct path, you could just use that value that you recorded, assuming you record it. But then this requires a lot of recording, right? So you need to ensure that your inputs didn't change. And you need to, yeah, exactly. Basically, you need to, if, you, if you're doing an add, if the inputs are always the same, then you're going to reuse that value all the time. How much do you save? Maybe not that much, right? Because that takes probably one cycle to execute or two cycles to execute. So this, this sort of reuse ideas have been proposed a lot, actually. Uh, unfortunately, they, ha they are not implemented because the savings happen to be much less compared to the hardware machinery you need to add so that we you can reuse the values. Now, again, if the software can give you a hint saying, oh, this part of the work is uh, reusable or something like that, maybe there is some benefit that, that you can gain from here. But those are, th those are ideas that are not also implemented in software yet. OK, these are the papers if you're interested in looking at those. OK, I think I've already discussed this very briefly. What if the system actually learned from wrong path execution and used that learning for better execution of the program and the system? It's something, some food for thought. OK. Maybe this is a good time to stop today's lecture. I don't want to start a topic too early. I can take questions, though. <laughs> yes? Yes? Uh, in the, at the compiler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some other stuff that's done over here that I've omitted. Oh, but you want to you want to move? Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe that's not a very optimized program, right? <laughs> In this case, there. Uh, so let's see. Basically, you want to move the loads over here and do the loads before. Yeah, you could do that. I think the reason uh, the reason they didn't do that here is. Uh, but it's, uh, the, what you're loading is really dependent on the branch, right? Uh -huh. The other is a minus the second. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah, sure. You could, you could do that. The compiler, maybe we didn't have an intelligent compiler here. 
but there are some other more general cases where these things are not exactly the same, but they happen to touch the ca same cache blocks. Those things the compiler cannot do. But you, you're, 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 you're very observant here. That's correct. Because these are actually the same things, you could, an intelligent compiler would fix that. What else? Yes? Oh, you came a bit late to the lecture, I think. <laughs> so we, we discussed that everything that's before this lecture is going to be covered, not this lecture. But uh, the midterm, uh, so maybe I can take the vote again right now <laughs> while we have time. Who strongly prefers that we have the midterm next week? So the, the other option is having it the other week so that you don't, you don't have it close to uh, the lab. Who strongly prefers it next week? Okay, three. Who strongly prefers it the other week? Wait, wait, you cannot vote for both. <laughs> okay, who strongly prefers it for November 30th, which is next week? One, two. Who strongly prefers it for December 7 or 8? 6 or 7, one of those. Oh, one. Okay, I, I see more hands for this next one. <laughs> okay. Well, let's not decide right now still. <laughs> but I see people who want to... Uh, so the reason I ask is because uh, the, 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 mm, the lab is the same week as the midterm. In general, I don't like doing that. Uh, the reason it happened this way is because labs got delayed a little bit. So it's better if actually we have it not during the time of the midterm. Uh, not, not, we have no lab during the time of midterm so that you can have more time. It seems like most of you agree, but not all of you. <laughs> okay, let's make a decision later. <laughs> Any questions? Any other questions? I see. <laughs> okay. Maybe you can convince your fellow students. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Okay, we'll, we'll talk and we'll, we may ask the question again. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Going once, twice. Any brilliant ideas on wrong path, correct path? <laughs> okay, I think we can call it today then. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>